Okay, so this is class number two of brokenness. Obviously, you guys weren't here for class number one. So, um, because of that, I thought it might be useful for you guys if we did a little quick review of what I went over in the first class. Because that way, it'll make more sense to go into what I had planned uh, for this class. And actually, I wanted to start off with a video that I did show the other class. But I was going to show them um, because it has a lot to do with how the world uh, treats brokenness. And by brokenness, we are thinking of like depression, right? Do any of you guys suffer depression sometimes? No. You guys get depressed? No. When you lose a battle of pressure. <laughs> when David loses a battle of clash, I right? said you <laughs> play the game. <laughs> Okay, so maybe you guys are not uh, at that stage in life yet where you um, where you feel super depressed, but it'll come. Trust me, it'll come. So hopefully, then this class will be helpful for you guys because there's a huge difference on the way that uh, Christianity looks at depression and the world and if you go with what the world tells you right then you're going to put your faith somewhere else but if you look at depression the way the bible tells you to look at depression then you know you're going to deal with it differently with over 350 million people affected by depression worldwide it's no doubt an incredibly real and serious issue but what exactly is going on inside of a depressed person is there a biological basis for these intense feelings of sadness? In the past, depression was often described as simply a chemical imbalance in the brain. Specifically, scientists believe that a lack of the neurotransmitter serotonin was to blame, which is often referred to as the feel-good chemical. However, the only real evidence for this was that when some depressed people were prescribed drugs which increased serotonin levels, it helped alleviate their symptoms. But while chemicals most certainly are involved, this view doesn't really capture just how complex depression is. In recent years, scientists began to notice that the brain cell growth and connections may actually play a larger role. When we look at the brain of a depressed person, studies show that the hippocampus tends to be much smaller than average. Other areas of the brain are also physically affected, but this region in particular controls memory and emotion. And the longer a person has been depressed, the smaller the hippocampus becomes. The cells and networks literally deteriorate. It turns out that stress may actually be a main trigger in the decrease of new neurons in this area of the brain. In fact, Studies have shown that when this region of the brain is regenerated and new neurons are stimulated, mood improves. Interestingly, many modern drugs, including those which affect serotonin levels, have an indirect effect on the growth of brain cells. This is likely why serotonin-based drugs seem to help some patients, but not for the reasons we once thought. Instead, they promote the release of other chemicals which ultimately stimulate neurogenesis or the growth of new neurons. Knowing this, some scientists now believe focus should be on drugs which directly affect neurogenesis. But while your neurons and chemicals may be the direct influencers, many genetic factors have been discovered as well. One particular study found that a variation in the serotonin transporter gene leaves individuals more vulnerable to depression. Every individual has two copies of the gene, one from each parent, and this gene can either be short or long. After tracking 800 young adults over 5 years, the study revealed that 33% of individuals with one short version became depressed after stressful life events, and people with two short genes fared even worse. On the other hand, those with two long genes were much less likely to become depressed with similar life stress. Many other genes have been identified which increase the likelihood of depression too, and it makes sense when you consider that depression and bipolar disorder both run in families. Studies of identical twins show that if one has bipolar disorder, the other has a 60-80% to 80 chance of developing it too. So while the true cause or causes of depression have yet to be pinned down precisely, and trust us, there's a huge list of other variables that studies suggest may come into play, it's important to remember that depression is a disease with a biological basis, along with psychological and social implications. It's not simply a weakness that somebody should get over or even something that we have a say in. And just like heart disease or cancer, shedding light onto the subject is of the utmost importance in order to bring funding and proper research. But is depression only a human phenomenon? We look into the question, do dogs get depressed, in our latest ASAP Thought video and discover the many studies done to understand depression among other species, including your pets at home. You Alright. So... 
What did you guys think of that video? David fell asleep. So after watching that video, um, there was a lot of stuff in that video, you know. Maybe I, I don't expect you guys to catch all of it. Oh, but what, what stuff did you catch from that video? Just anything. What did you catch? It's all psychological. Take drugs. Yeah. Take drugs, right? <laughs> the focus should be on drugs. That's what the, literally what the person said. Drugs that, um, that promote neurogenesis. That's what they call it. What else? What else did you get this, from this video? That there's a science behind it. Yeah, there's a science behind it. Like it's <laughs> biologically based, right? Depression is a biological thing, among other things. It has some biological basis. So my question to you guys would be is that if you accept and just take their word for it, take, you know, take it at face value and you believe it, where would a person put their faith in in order to treat their depression? Where would they put their faith after having watched a video like that? Something less. Something less? Like, you know, like, what would they hope, what, where would their hope be? After watching a video like that, where would they put their hopes? On the medicine. On, on medicine, drugs. on drugs, right? And that's exactly what's going on right now. Like, a lot of people who suffer depression, they go to the doctor and they get on meds if they can't handle it. You know, people, most people deal with depression. Like, when you get older, you know, you're... You start having to take care of yourself, you get bills, you think about a lot of things, you know, you have your dreams, your goals, you want to, you know, you want a certain job, you want to make a certain amount of money, you want a girlfriend or a wife, or you want to get married, you want to have children, you want to have a house, you want to have a car, you want to have a phone, you know, so when you get older, you, there's a lot of things and, and all of this stuff, and sometimes... People do not get, not just sometimes, I mean like every time, people don't get what they dream for immediately. And this causes people to enter like a depression state. And sometimes it gets like too much, you know? Like for example, somebody may be super happy with a boyfriend or girlfriend and then all of a sudden, you know, the other person breaks up with them. And they don't know how to deal with this. So they take drugs, they go to the doctor, they say, I can't cope with all these feelings, emotions, please give me something. And they get on drugs, right? They start taking meds. Um, so <clears throat> um, in the last class, we talked about how there's two kinds of brokenness, right? There's a brokenness that, uh, that the Bible calls a worldly brokenness that leads to death and then there's a godly brokenness that leads to repentance okay and uh, so worldly sorrow um, so worldly yeah. sorrow is the kind of sorrow that you're gonna feel and it's gonna make you guys feel hopeless uh, it might even make you guys um, have thoughts of suicide if it gets super bad, you know, you know, are you guys, you guys aren't in high school yet, are you? Yeah. Oh, you're in high school. Okay. We're all in high school. Oh, you are? Yes. Okay. Um, so, I mean, when I was in high school, let's see, yeah, I did know a couple of incidents where, um, you know, a couple kids killed themselves. Have you guys... Uh, run into that in your own experience yet. Known anybody in your school that took their own life because of depression? No? Okay. Well, I mean, that's the worldly kind of sorrow when, you know, you get these crazy thoughts, you feel hopeless, um, you know, they're demonic, basically. Um, but today, I want to focus more on world, I mean, godly sorrow.
Okay, uh, one question that I asked in um, the previous class is, what causes brokenness? What causes brokenness? What, what causes people to break? So, um, when you really think about it, um, the, the, basically the most common thing that breaks people is sin itself. You know, somebody, not necessarily the person that is broken, was the person that sinned. Most like, more likely, it's often another person who sins breaks somebody else, right? Causes another person to, to be broken. Uh, but many times, it's also the person's own sin that breaks themselves. So suffering, you know, sin leads to suffering. And when you suffer a lot, you know, that can break you. Um, but the Bible also talks about another cause of brokenness. And you guys, aside from sin and the devil, what is the other cause of brokenness that you guys could, can think of? It's wild guy. Shame. Well, shame is, is related to sin, right? When you... When you feel ashamed, it's because you did something wrong. Probably any guesses? What other, what other cause? All right, so I'm just going to say the answer. The other cause of brokenness is God Himself. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because sometimes God, you know, God will use uh, various means to break people that He wants to break. And it's important for you guys to know this, especially before it happens, so that you understand that the things you are going through is because either God is allowing them to happen or because God is actually, you know, wanting them to happen. As horrible as that may seem at the time. You know, because we can we go through things and we cannot make any sense of what's going on and so we're, we're confused we're angry we're sad a lot of things um, but it's good for us to know that God breaks people okay Singles. huh okay why would God break people so we can build them up stronger exactly build them up stronger um, <clears throat> So, now we're talking about godly sorrow, godly brokenness, okay? The godly brokenness um, helps us, His children, uh, increase in our understanding of stuff. Um, when we are broken by God, when we are experiencing godly sorrow, we become more acquainted with God's mercy because we plead for His mercy. And, and therefore, God sheds His mercy when we plead for it. And so we, we get to experience what His mercy and grace is all about. Um, you will get to understand yourself. You know, the kinds of things that... Uh, your limits. You understand your own limits when God breaks you. You know, you'll understand that there's only so far that He can go before you you actually turn to God. You know, and that's one of the things that, you know, unfortunately, for some reason, there's something in us where we feel like, no, I can do this. I can get myself through this. You know, I'm going to figure it out. You know, and so that's the kind of thinking that keeps us from crying out to God. And so God has to push us further than that. You know, he has to push us beyond our limits in order for us to finally focus away from ourselves and focus on Him and turn to Him. So you get to learn about yourself. Um, and very important also, godly sorrow um, helps us be compassionate towards other people who are suffering. You know, when you see other people suffer, and you yourself have gone through suffering, then it's easier for, you, for your heart to go out to them. 
right? You sympathize with the other person because you've been through it. And so you can provide words of comfort. You can provide words of encouragement. You know, you have gone through it and you've seen that God has helped you through it. And so, you know, you can provide that kind of advice, wisdom, and encouragement to the other person that you see is going through the similar thing. Okay. Any questions so far? Any comments that you guys have? No? Does any of this make sense? Yes? Okay. So I'll continue. <coughs> All right. So, um, so again, continuing with the question of why God decides to break people, right? Uh, why God uh, allows people people to become really depressed his children okay because um, well number one God wants people that know how to pray and I don't know if you guys I know you guys are young still you know I'm trying to I'm trying to picture myself how I felt at your age you guys are what 12 13 14 <laughs> Um, and I, you know, I at your age, shoot, I, I didn't think about this stuff at all. You know, I'm actually, you know, it's encouraging to see you guys here, even though there's only three of you. But you know, you guys are getting valuable information, like insight that'll help you. That, you know, whether you realize it or not, uh, these classes uh, will help you when you get just a little older. You know, maybe a year from now, a couple of years, but you'll remember stuff that you learn in church. Um, but, uh, you know, I remember the first time that I, of my own free will, decided to bend my knees and pray to God out of desperation. I remember the exact day where I was, you know, I was in a bathroom. I, the, the lights turned off and I was I think I was 17 years old at 17 years I had come to the point where I had no idea how to handle the uh, depression or the emotion that I was dealing with and so it was the very first time that I decided I'm gonna go pray so you know I was not at my I was not at my own home I was at somebody else's house but I went to the bathroom locked the door shut the lights off and that was the very first time that I of my own yeah, nobody forced me to pray right because before that um, anytime that I prayed it was because I was being forced to pray right my parents or it was time to pray for the food or whatever you know, at church, oh, let's all pray now. It, well, it didn't come from me. But that was the first time that it ever came from me. And that's one of the reasons why God breaks people. Because He wants people that know how to pray. And what's the only reason you're going to pray? You know, the only, the, the prayers that really matter to God are the ones that are honest, sincere, full-hearted cries out to God. Those are the ones that, you know, uh, the Bible says that those prayers are a, a sweet savor to Him. You know when you, uh, when you like uh, go into the kitchen and you smell something delicious? You know, it's like, mmm, that smells good. That's, yeah. <laughs> um, that's what prayers are like. Those kinds of prayers, it's like a smell to Him. When he, when the child of his is on their knees, totally broken, crying out to him in desperation, God smell, you know, he smells it. Mmm, that's delicious. You know, that's what he enjoys when a person, huh? What? Do you say that's just weird? Okay. So he he wants people that know how to pray. That's one of the reasons why God breaks people. Uh, what's another reason? Because God wants people 
who know how to tr put their entire faith and trust on Him, right? Um, because, uh, again, you know, until you're broken beyond your limits, you will figure out a way to cope with it. Um, you may turn to drugs, you may turn to video games, you may turn to uh, another person, you know, your family, friends, girlfriend, boyfriend. Uh, there's a lot of ways that people use to deal with their brokenness. Um, and sometimes God will basically take everything away. Or basically, um, you know, He will make it so that the person understands that nothing is working. And so He will break the person to the point where the person is forced is forced to put their trust in Him and nothing else. Like hitting rock bottom, right? Like hitting rock bottom, exactly. And everybody has their own rock bottom, you know? You don't know what your rock bottom is, but God will make you find your own rock bottom, you know? That's where you, did, that's where you say, holy smokes, I never thought I would find myself in this kind of situation. You know, this is like, this doesn't make any sense to me. This is not how I saw my life turning out. And, you know, that's when you begin to put your faith in something that is stronger, you know, more powerful, more stable than anything. Like, like your friends are, um, you know, temporary or unreliable like sometimes yeah you have good friends you know that will want to help but they'll find that they cannot help you they don't know what to tell you they don't you know there's nothing they can say or do to make you feel better even though they're a good friend and they're there but they won't be able to say anything to help you so you realize that not even your friends you know you can't you know, they, they can't always provide that, that level of comfort that you seek in them. So you will put your faith in God. So, you know, God needs people who know how to trust Him. Um, and you won't learn to trust God until you lose your trust in everything else. Right? Even yourself. You know, because that's like a message that we hear out there. Just like... Believe in yourself. Just trust in yourself. Yeah, try, you know, trust your gut. You know, you can do it. You have it in you and this and that. But the Bible doesn't, that's like opposite of what the Bible teaches us. Like, know that um, trusting yourself is a big mistake, actually. That you have to put your trust in God, in Jesus Christ, not yourself. And obviously, like I already mentioned, you know, how to sympathize. God needs people who know how to sympathize. Um, you know, do you, when somebody else is sad or angry, do you, do you guys know how to interact with those people? Or do you guys just like, oh, you know, that's just David being, you know, David again. Or, you know, that's just whatever, you know, they have their own, let them deal with their own stuff. I got my own stuff to deal with. It's hard sometimes. It is hard. It's very yeah, hard. Because there's like people are that are hysterical. Yeah. And they're like, how do you do this? Like, I can talk to somebody who's like, hey, I feel bad. And then they have a conversation. We talk about it and sympathize, sympathize about it. But then what if the the girl starts crying or the guy starts crying? What do you do? And I'm like, oh, dude. Uh -huh. All I can do is like give them a hug and pat them on the back. It's like, it's okay. It's right. Okay. Yes. Yes. So it is difficult. And, you know. I believe that God um, helps us, um, brings us around or brings other people around us um, that can sympathize with us or that we can sympathize with others. Sometimes you, you are in a situation where you just don't know how to handle it and uh, you, know, you just kind of do your best. Um, but ultimately, ultimately you, you still have to you know, pray for the person, put, put, uh, put that person into God's hands. So, let's uh, read a couple passages. 
Uh, Psalms 34, 18. Psalms 34, 18. One of you guys can read it. Give you your Bible, David. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Okay. The Lord is near to those who are brokenhearted and saves such as have, mine says a contrite spirit, uh, but Joshua's version is it's crushed. crushed. In spirit. And actually that's a good uh, translation. Um because the word, the Hebrew word that is used for in mind contrite or in Josh's crushed, um, it literally means like ground to pieces, you know, crushed to a fine dust. So it basically says the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves those that have a spirit that's been crushed to find dust, you know? And I know you guys already told me that you guys haven't really experienced that, um, you know, but that's a devastating feeling. The feeling of your spirit just crushed, you know, where you just don't even know what to do with yourself anymore. That's when God comes in and saves. Okay, um, I think we already read Isaiah 57. Let me read that. <clears throat> 57? Yeah, Isaiah 57, 15. 15. For this is what the high and exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in the high and the holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of, of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Okay. So, again, here God is saying that, you know, He's way up there. He's a high and lofty one. Right? I dwell in the high and holy place. Like inaccessible. You know, just, you know, the heights. Just try to imagine God just way, way up there. Right? But he says, but I, I know it all. I, I do not only live up there in the heaven of heavens. I also dwell with him who is lowly, right? He dwells with the lowly and the humble to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. You know, again, God loves a crushed spirit, right? Remember that because like I, like I said at the beginning of the class, you guys are going to go through it. And when you are going through it, remember that God has you exactly where He wants you. You know, that's when you can cry out to God. You can, you can definitely look at it in the way, like real, real life sense, like with my promotion. Mm -hmm. One of my managers told me to forget everything you know, forget it. Even if, it, the t if your uh, mentor is teach you something that you already know, humble yourself and forget what you know and listen to it again. Because maybe you've been doing it wrong. So to forget humbling yourself to forgetting what you already know uh -huh. and actually listening to the higher power to break down everything that in the spiritual sense to break down everything and forget about what your parents taught you and everything. So probably that's why God breaks you down. It's like, maybe you were taught wrong. 
Yes. That's actually a very good point. You know, um, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting your name. Yes. Alexis. Alexis. Um, and I, I know you've been coming to this church for a while. Uh, Browley, pretty much born into this church. David, you were born into this church. No, so, you know, what Josh is saying is very important because do not assume that just because you've been coming to church for a very long time or even born into the church your whole life. So you've been coming to church your whole life, David and Bradley. And Alexis, you know, you've probably been coming to church for a long portion of your life now. But don't assume that just because you've been going to church your whole life that God isn't going to allow certain things to happen in your life. You know, sometimes God knows He has to do it to do exactly what Joshua said, to basically make you just forget everything that you thought that you think you know. Uh, because a lot of that, uh, a lot of those things that we think we know, we actually just tell ourselves. It's not something that the Bible actually teaches. We just assume that it is taught in the Bible, or we assume that that's what God, that's how God operates, and so He crushes us in order to, so that we can unlearn a lot of this stuff, so we can start uh, knowing Him um, in truth, like so we can we can come under to an understanding of how He really operates. Um, so I just I know that we're running out of time already. But I just want to look at a couple examples. So uh, let's take a, a few examples of godly sorrow. Um, let's read 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10. Um, actually, verse 9, 10, and 11. Probably can can you read that? Or Alexis, can you read that actually? First Samuel chapter one nine, ten, and eleven. After they had eaten and drank in the something, Hannah rose, and now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and weeped bitterly. And it, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son that I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And now Razor shall touch his head. Okay, so here we read about Hannah, right? And there was one thing that Hannah wanted above all things. What was that? She wanted a son. Right? She, she, had, she was barren. She had no kids. She couldn't have any kids. She, and uh, her husband actually had two wives, herself and another lady. And with that lady, the, the husband had um, more than one son. And that other lady would almost mock Hannah, you know, just despise or treat her harshly because Hannah had no children. So there was that, uh, you know, in verse 10, my version says, and she was in bitterness of soul. Bitterness of soul. And prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. You know, that's, she was broken. Hannah was broken. But she knew where to turn. You know, she turned to the Lord and she, she prayed a prayer. And she made a vow that if, if God would give her a son, that she would basically, um, uh, what's the word? She would um, surrender. surrender the son to the Lord and he would be like a priest. He would be a Nazarite. You know, when she says, no razor shall come upon his head. That's the that's uh, the same um, vow, or the same. Uh, it was called the Nazarite vow. It's the same vow that Samson was a part of. No razor came upon Samson's head because he was a Nazarite. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, and God heard her prayer. 
because it was a prayer of bitterness of her soul and an anguish of her heart. So she cried out, you know, with all her strength. And God answered her prayer and gave her Samuel. And that's how, you know, the prophet Samuel was born. Okay. Uh, let's see how much time do we have left. Five minutes. Oh, shoot. Okay, we're already... It's one, one more uh, example. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll finish with that. See, I'm going to read Psalms chapter 6. David, David experienced a lot of crazy things in his life. So he was very acquainted with brokenness. Six what? I just put down Psalm 6. So it's probably... Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read... Yeah. Maybe not all of it, but uh, most of it. Right, listen to David. Not you, David. The real David. Not the fake David. Okay. It says... O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me or punish me in your hot displeasure. Okay, so already we see that David he feels like, you know, he's incurred um, judgment. He, you know, we don't know exactly what he did. I don't think this is the, uh, the psalm he wrote after Bathsheba. But he does feel like, you know, God is punishing him for some reason. Uh, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver me, and save me for your mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? Verse 6, I am weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. Uh, what, what is David saying here? Like he's literally crying himself to sleep every night. You know, I've, you know, I've done this. I've been in a position where I'm crying myself to sleep. You know, because I have no idea, you know, how I'm going to get out of this situation. You know, I have no idea what's going to, you know, what's going to happen in my life. And here David is confessing, you know, and because he's a poet, I like the way he puts it. I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with tears. Couch is another word for bed in those days. My eyes waste away because of grief. It grows old because of all my enemies. Um, so I just, uh, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Okay. So, um, you know, when you study your Bible, you will see that, that God routinely breaks His people. In order for them to cry, cry out to Him in prayer, in order for them to put their full trust in Him, in order for them to be able to sympathize and be compassionate with everyone else that's going through their suffering. Um, so, and you know, and that all of that leads to that spiritual growth. That's how God makes His children grow spiritually. It's through suffering. You know, through trials and tribulations. That is the number one way that we grow, unfortunately. You know, when things are going well for us, when things are going really good for us, you know, it's like we, uh, we tend to forget to pray. We tend to forget to exercise all these spiritual things that we need to exercise. And uh, let me just end with this quote from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis is the guy who wrote uh, Chronicles of Narnia. But he was a... Uh, and a um, bunch of other books. And a bunch of other books. And he was actually a, a super intelligent Christian. Like He wrote a whole bunch of other books that defend Christianity. But here's what he says. You never know how much you really believe anything until 
its truth or its falsehood becomes a, a matter of life and death to you. It's easy to say that you believe a rope is strong as long as you are just using it to, um, to cord a box, right? It's easy to believe that a rope is strong when all you're using it for is to just wrap a box. But are you going to believe that rope is strong when you're dangling for your life? When you have to put your life on it, right? So you don't know how much you really believe anything until it's a matter of life and death to you. So, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I believe in God. Oh, I love God. Do you really? You don't really know that until you are put in the position where you have to put your life in the hands of God. God will do that by breaking you. Okay, that's the end of the class. Um, so, let's stand and uh, Josh, can you pray us out? Yeah.